Today in this video I'll be extracting tooth number 18, tooth number 19, and root tip number 20. Tooth number 18 will be a simple extraction, tooth number 19 and root tip number 20 will require uh, flap and sectioning. And tooth, uh, root tip number 20 and pretending will have a curved roof anatomy, so which will require a distal trough. Uh, one of my main objectives in this video will be speed and efficiency with the extraction. So here just three carpels of lidocaine, uh, two for a uh, block, and the third one for the long buccal infiltration and buccal lingual infiltrations. Clinically, uh, infiltrations will help with, uh, with reflecting the flap. So I'm starting here with tooth number 18, I'm using the uh, periosteal elevator to loosen up the uh, periodontal ligaments. So normally, I would be in using an elevator, but I'm trying to see what I can get away with by going straight to the cow horn here. The logic, by removing the most posterior tooth and working more anteriorly, you have more leverage with elevators by using the tooth anterior to the extraction site. So if, for instance, if I took out root number 20 and then tried to extract tooth number 19, I wouldn't have my elevator to uh, lean on against when trying to uh, elevate tooth number 19. So here I'm starting to regret not elevating the uh, tooth first and I'm requiring a lot of forces here with the forceps. So no broken roots for this uh, for this extraction, but by not elevating first, there was uh, risk of uh, breaking roots or uh, a buccal plate fracture, as uh, as was present here with this tooth. So here I'm beginning the uh, full thickness envelope flap for bar access and visibility for the next two teeth. Using a 15 blade, and going uh, following the tooth and the papillas. So when reflecting flaps and clinically especially around this area you gotta be uh, it's important to be aware when where the mental foramens usually around the premolar apex area so it's important not to extend your flap too apically if not necessary So around here, I'm starting to begin my sectioning of tooth number 19. So some considerations while sectioning uh, a mandibular molar, you want to go about three fourths of the buccal lingual, uh, buccal lingually to avoid accidentally damaging the lingual plate where the uh, lingual nerve may be. One question I've always wondered until I asked uh, the uh, OS resident recently, just how deep do you do when you're sectioning? How, or how, how, how do you know how deep to section? And the answer I got was section to section deeper than you think. Since the whole purpose of se sectioning a tooth is to make the extraction easier, if you have a bad section or a section where you didn't go deep enough and the crown fractures from the root, 
you're only making it harder and uh, more complications than if you sectioned it deeper and had a cleaner uh, cleaner separation. And if you slightly mix the uh, the uh, inter-ridicular septum of the uh, tooth in the socket, uh, it's fine since you're most likely going to recontour it with a bone lunger after the extraction. Here I'm inserting an elevator between the two sections to complete the separation and splitting it into the zeal and distal section. With this meso section, I shall spend more time elevating and went straight for the universal force up, mandibular force up. And actually, I had no luck with this force up, and I went for a uh, Ronger after this. And with the Ronger, I ended up fracturing the crown off with a uh, root tip, meso root tip left. I just went straight for distal here. This still came out uneventfully. And with the uh, now for the meso root, it easily popped off with the uh, hindbrink root tip elevator. Now, some more socket deprimement. So now I'm troughing. Tooth number, uh, root tip number 20. Since it has a distally curved root, it's going to help with the release more distally. I'm just loosening it up here with the spade elevator. Came right off. So it's, it's important to uh, the, to use a curette and uh, debride the sockets. Take out any granulation tissues. Uh, maybe leftover uh, bone spars. Will reduce uh, post-op discomfort. Reduce infection and the possibility of uh, delayed healing so it's just good to take it out during the uh, procedure and some saline integration to flush the uh, socket so now for the suturing um, I think I did about six or five sutures here starting with tooth number 18 I wanted to practice using the uh, Castro Vajito needle driver which handles pretty differently compared to a uh, your traditional needle holder instead of uh, palming it like most uh, drivers you hold it like a pencil which definitely took some time to get used to. It's also it's also slightly tricky to uh, reload and unload the needle. I guess what helped me uh, engage the uh, mechanism was uh, thinking of it as a uh, holding, hold the needle, slowly apply force, and keep holding rather than the uh, traditional needle, needle driver where you hold 
apply a large for uh, apply a large force and let go if if that makes sense. Here I'm doing a figure of eight, but that's really not too necessary since a, um, a suture is not necessary to holding a clot. So here I'm doing a uh, hand knot technique. I learned this from a few uh, from a, from like a, a YouTube channel, YouTube video, YouTube video. Some. The benefit of uh, hand hand knots is uh, they're great for posterior regions such as the uh, third molar areas where using a needle driver can be tricky. While a negative includes requiring you to use a uh, longer suture length, which uses uses up the uh, suture faster. Yeah, I think here. Uh, I kept slipping. I didn't have a uh, long enough uh, long length to uh, work with. And I'm just a little rusty here. I think it took me like five tries to get one of the knot one of the knots. So some considerations while suturing uh, off the top of my head. Try to keep about two to three millimeters from the margins of the flap. And make sure to suture back to the, the uh, papillas. That's really the important part, not really the sockets. And also not to make your sutures too tight which can cut the uh, blood supply to the tissues. As for how many uh, throws I do, I do about, I, I do three throws total. So the first one I wrote, I, uh, I rotated, I rotated about three times and then the second throw, I only do it once counterclockwise and then third one, once clockwise. And then usually holds up just enough. As for how many throws with hand knotting? Uh, I do four four throws total for a hand knot. So really you don't want to make it tight, your suture is too tight. So the whole purpose of suturing is just to uh, just to get the your flop back to uh, back to where it was. Not so much of holding it in, but more of uh, placing them together. And then the body will uh, eventually do the uh, primary intention of uh, healing.
Yeah, here I think this is um four throws total. I believe I'm gonna be doing two more sutures here. Getting the papilla of the uh, tooth number 20 and then distal papilla of uh, tooth number 18 after this. As to why I'm using silk sutures here, uh, they're just the cheapest available. Good for practice. And they're easy to see compared to uh, using chromic gut or plain gut, which is uh, like a yellow color. Although these uh, silk sutures, they, uh, they break really easily. So here, yeah, I believe the uh, sutures are getting pretty short, so it's getting pretty hard to, uh, it's getting really tricky to get my throws in. Yeah, I kept slipping here. I think I was getting pretty frustrated at this time. <laughs> See, so this is just one, uh, one circle around the, uh, the driver for the final knot or final throw. And that's the final suture. Hope you learned a lot as I did making this video and thanks for watching.